Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Rick Weisford. I introduced myself last time. I'm the faculty director of the Making Caring Common Project, and I teach here at the Ed School and at the Kennedy School of Government. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to our session today on voter rights and voter suppression. I'm very excited about this session. I think you're going to find it very useful and engaging. Um, we are going to use a little bit of a different format this time, rather than having uh, the presenters um, speak each for five minutes, we're just going to go right into the interview. And we have two terrific interviewers here. So we're going to be doing the interview for 20, 25 minutes or so. And then we're going to leave more time for your questions. So we will have 10 or 15 minutes for your questions. So please put your questions in the Q&A. Um, we also have closed captioning. And you should be able to turn on your closed captioning at the bottom of your screen. All right, let's jump into this. I want to introduce our speakers. Um, uh, or our, first, our interviewers. Martha Minow is going to be one of our interviewers. She is a, a great friend and a great collaborator. She is a university professor, which is a rare honor here at Harvard. She was the dean of Harvard Law School. She has written beautifully and brilliantly about reconciliation and difference and school integration and forgiveness. I really recommend her book. She's a wonderful scholar. Um, Tarun Amasa is also with us today, and you've heard from him before. He is a recent graduate of high school from Colorado and a member of the Making Caring Common Youth Advisory Board and a wonderful person. And he will also be interviewing. So Martha and Tarun will be doing the interviewing today. Um, Kia Sims has uh, agreed to be interviewed. Kia Sims it works for, she's an organizing leader at Fair Fight. And many of you may have heard of Fair Fight. It was started by Stacey Abrams to fight voter suppression. And she will be talking about voter rights and voter suppression and she has um, lots of experience working on campaigns um, and organizing, including organizing young people. And we will also be hearing from Mike Firestone, who's uh, chief of staff at the Attorney General's office in Massachusetts and a lawyer, but an expert on voter protection who has worked for a number of organizations on voter protection over the year, as well as on a number of political campaigns as a field organizer. So we are delighted to have these four folks with us today. And I'm going to turn it over to them. And I think Martha is going to ask the first question. I sure am. And thank you, uh, Rick, for organizing this and everybody else for participating. I have a double header question that I'm going to ask both Kia and Mike. And my question is, what's top of mind for you this week? What are you focused on this week? And if you can also say, and why are you passionate about addressing voter suppression? That would be great. I'm like, there's so many things happening. <laughs> Which one is it? <laughs> so I guess, okay, let's start with what happened last week because that kind of has been on my mind. So as you know, our president um, mentioned that he wanted to possibly push back the election. Um, and so that brought up a lot of stuff this week on our end about how are we going to fight disinformation and how that can lead to all types of voter suppression leading up to this November election cycle. So that has definitely been something that we've been trying to think through. How can we combat this on social media? What does that look like? Um, so that's definitely been top of mind for me this week. Um, and then Martha, what was the second part of your question? I think it was what made there me that passionate, about voter suppression. passionate about uh, voter suppression issues. Okay, got um, And so I've kind of been passionate about it. Um, I think I got my wake up call in 2016 when I was sitting in Louisiana, because I was there at the time, um, watching Georgia's gubernatorial election on television and was absolutely horrified. Um, when I got all these text messages from friends and family saying, I waited in line for four hours. I had a friend who was in Savannah who waited in line and was pregnant for four hours on her feet trying to get to vote. Um, and immediately my mom waited in line for a really long time for the first time ever. And I kind of got this wake up call like, okay, what am I gonna do about this? How do I get involved? Um, and so luckily, a couple months later, Fair Fight Action was founded, and I got to get started with them, so. Great. Um, 
Martha, it's a really good question. I think, what am I thinking about right now? I'm thinking about the fact that Michigan is having its primary today. And so uh, what do we know about Michigan? Well, we know that it's one of the very closest uh, elections in 2016 on a state level. It's going to be an incredible battleground uh, this coming fall. This is a state with very little history of voting by mail, like so much of the country. And yet their secretary of state, in an effort to get out in front of uh, the COVID-19 uh, challenges around voting, which I know we'll talk more about, mailed an absentee ballot request form to 7.7 million registered voters in that state. So now we're going to see sort of what's happened. We've seen unprecedented numbers of people voting by mail, but we're also seeing a lot of challenges, particularly in urban areas where people have no history of voting by mail before. A lot of people are confused about the rules. They've never done this before. Um, and because this is a state primary, it's going to be a relatively low turnout election compared to what we expect to see in November. So what we're looking at right now is how are these local clerks handling sort of unprecedented challenges maintaining safe in-person voting locations and simultaneously unprecedented numbers of mail-in ballots, which need to be processed and counted and tabulated in totally different ways. So uh, that's what I'm watching today. Uh, and uh, for uh, everybody who's sort of following along uh, at home, we are living this experience sort of on a week by week basis. And we're going to continue every day for the next three months. Uh, why am I in this fight? Uh, because uh, the right to vote is um, the way that we express ourselves collectively. And it is the way that we make change, make big, broad, sweeping change in a uh, free democracy. And that is under threat in this country right now because of threats to voting rights. Um, if you can't vote, uh, then you can't speak. You can't enact change. And so it is the right upon which so many others are based. And uh, it is all of our job to go out there and fight for it. Thank you. And Tarun, your turn. Hi, thank you so much for that awesome question. It's super insightful and it's awesome to hear about your history, both to support voters and becoming more enfranchised in that whole process. I just want to say it's super empowering, Kia, that you were able to do it at such a young age and you're pursuing that and then Michael for continuing this for such a long time and having this track record. Yeah, a young age, yep. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean it like that, but I, I, I mean, either way, I just want to say thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. And one way that I wanted to bounce off um, Professor Minow's question was to ask, what is the role that students can do to help enfranchise voters and stop voter suppression. So there's the policy perspective, which is either from policymakers, like having more voting polls, et cetera, like legislation change. But how do you mobilize youth to make a difference that's both long lasting and powerful enough to catalyze other communities to follow suit? Sure, maybe I'll take that one first. Uh, I'm gonna give you two answers. The first is, um, we, we know in this country that uh, these, these elections are like the topic of conversation for a year. And then when it finally comes to voting, tens of millions of Americans don't participate. And unfortunately, so many of them are young people who are so impacted by the critical issues that are or are not, you know, um, you know, being decided in these elections or, or just are ignored cycle after cycle by political leaders. So uh, voting is the opportunity to hold our political parties and our government officials accountable to the issues that matter to young people. And people have got to go out and exercise that vote. It's like exercising, you got to practice it, right? And sometimes you need a training buddy. So what I would say is the most important thing to do, whether you're at a campus that is remote or you've just graduated, or you're back to classes in some form or fashion, is tell your friends to vote, right? Get out there, don't feel shy, organize on your campus or in your virtual community because youth participation is critical. And I'm gonna say one other thing, uh, we can obviously talk about being involved in campaigns directly because I think that's critical, 
But uh, one thing we know is that COVID-19 has presented a real threat to our American infrastructure simply to keep polling locations open. So in, an, in 2016, about 900,000 Americans worked either in early voting or on election day as poll workers, right? Just to be there to check people in and hand out ballots and have people put them in the machines and give them that sticker on the way out. 900,000 people, that's a huge undertaking. And uh, for those of you who voted before, you know that a lot of these people are older. Uh, they've done it for decades in many cases. And many of those people are not going to be comfortable sitting at a polling location uh, this time around just because of the health risks, uh, even if there are masks and protective equipment and other things. So we need a new generation of young people to step up and join in this civic opportunity. And there are some uh, websites where people can go to sign up to get information about volunteering in your own community to just help ensure that the neighborhood polling location that, you're, that people have relied upon has enough people to stay open so that people can go and cast that ballot if they choose to vote in person. Yeah, and I want to completely echo what Mike said. Um, this poll worker shortage is a huge issue, and it is one of the major reasons that Georgia's elections in June um, were such a catastrophe as they were just because they were literally training poll workers the day before the election because people simply just didn't feel comfortable um, being poll workers and so we would lo like love to see some young people get out there and also the technology with these new machines um, young people have grew up with grown up with technology their entire lives and so it's a lot easier to train them to use the new machines um, to work them and like also are they able to fix some of stuff goes wrong but I've also saying um this last election cycle I have been absolutely amazed by how young people have already been stepping up um and have really been combating the narrative that young people don't care and they aren't civically engaged and I think that you all and myself included because I'm in the 18 to 25 category um <laughs> have been like really proving that that's just not the case anymore and we're excited and ready Terrific. So my next question is about sources of information, especially in this COVID-19 era. You know, where is your poll, polling place? Is it going to be the same place? How do you get an absentee ballot? What's the difference between an absentee ballot and a mail-in ballot? What are the ways to make sure your, your ballot is, that you mailed in is counted as opposed to rejected? How do we get the information the people need out? What are reliable sources and what are your thoughts about that? Do you want me to take that first, Kia? Sure, sure. So first, I would start with, uh, I would start with the Secretary of State in the state where you live. They're the lead elections official for that state and from their website is going to be sort of the best clearinghouse of information. It might very well be that if you're in a city somewhere that there'll be the most up-to-date information about uh, where people vote will be housed on the city website because in some cases they're still making those determinations because we're still a few months out. But um, this is a place where there are going to be some incredible other resources that we can direct people to. Um, there's actually been uh, like a very cool project um, uh, that uh, there's, there are some very cool websites that sort of update this information. And actually, I will say Google's done a pretty good job of helping people figure out their polling location in recent election cycles. Um, but uh, in this case, uh, it is critical that people go to trusted sort of elected leaders, cities, uh, you know, mayors, governors, secretaries of state that are pushing out good information um, and sharing that information with their friends. Uh, the most important thing that all of us can do, because we're also communicators ourselves on social media and elsewhere, is communicate that uh, elections are going to be safe, uh, votes are going to be counted, and just bring down the temperature a little bit. Uh, you know, as Kia alluded to, we have leadership right now um, 
it, you know, our president uh, traffics uh, misinformation uh, and sort of suppressive messages to uh, scare people away from the safest ways to vote sort of all the time. And uh, so I say this not as a partisan matter, but just generally, like he, he's not a trusted source of information, unfortunately. So, um, you know, look elsewhere. So, Kia, but can you can you uh, add to this anything that social media can be helpful on for that eighteen to twenty five year old group? Absolutely. Um, just like Mike said, check your Secretary of State's website. That's always going to be source number one, and then share the fact that everyone needs to be checking the Secretary of State's office with your friends on social media. Whatever state you're in, share that link. Also make sure um, while they're there, people are checking to make sure that their voter registration is up to date because that's gonna be a huge component going into, going into this election and making sure that they're still active and on the rolls um, and just talk, making it normal to talk with your friends on social media about it. Like you can uh, share like what you're binging on Netflix and one post and then the next, like it just needs to be all this information about the upcoming election because flooding people with it makes it uh, impossible for you to look away um and yeah that'd be my just share it all the time even if people get annoyed with you because my friends do all the time they're like can you talk about something else besides voting uh, i'm like no everyone needs to talk about it so <laughs> awesome and asking what are their plans to vote so everybody makes a plan absolutely absolutely um, oh yes another thing uh, I, you know, I just wanted to um just on this same, sort of same topic about sort of like having good information out there, um, you know, we can really use young people uh, also who are connected to non-English speaking communities to uh, really be that voice and sort of help get that message out. It's not on you individually. In fact, like in the work that I do and in some of the voting rights advocacy I've done, we're sending messages to city councilors and and clerks and elections administrators at the state and local level that it is their job to clearly communicate. Like this isn't all on us as like the people, like we're not the ones choosing the polling locations. We need election officials to step up and, and, and be accountable here. And so we need to hold their feet to the fire, right? Um, so a part of this isn't like you not, must now know every single polling location in greater Philadelphia. Right. Part of this is saying to the leadership that, you know, the city commissioners in Philadelphia, for example, you got to get the word out. You got to figure out where those polling locations are going to be early. Um, that's what I want to see. So, you know, engaging with these decision makers to say, share information, share good information, put out information in other languages. Right. Because that's how we get the word out. So it's it's holding the elections infrastructure in this country accountable to delivering information to constituents. That's great. Tarun, your turn. Hi. Uh, yeah, hello again. So my next question kind of surrounds the idea of accountability for elected officials. I know that you've worked with elected officials in the past and then Mike, you've worked on campaigns and in other positions of elected with elected officials and as an elected official. And my question to you is how do we work to keep elected officials accountable to their goals because I think it's one thing to go to the voting poll and vote for something and vote for someone but it's another thing for that to happen because I know in elementary school I used to run as class president and I always used to win off the platform of I'll build a new playground and a new pool and five years later there's no pool there's no playground and I think they're a little upset at me and I was just curious how at like the national level do you keep elected officials accountable to their goals can start off with, I don't know if y'all check Fairify Actions, Twitter, Instagram, but we love calling out our Secretary of State at every second we get. Um, and that is so important because a lot of the times Secretary of State and boards of elections, even at a county level, no one goes to the meetings, no one knows who they are, and they're making these huge decisions about where our polling locations are. Um, where our drop uh, absentee ballot drop boxes are, and they're making these decisions kind of in the dark because until honestly this year, no one had really been paying attention. Well, a lot of people hadn't been paying attention to what they were doing. Um, and so I think if one of that is like 
go to your local board of elections meeting or your state board of elections and like watch what's going on, make public comment. Um, they love to see students get up there and talk about how, well, they don't necessarily love it all the time, but we see more action from them when students get up there and they talk about, I tried to vote, but I didn't get my absentee ballot in the mail. Or um, I had a really hard time changing my address and then therefore was unable to vote. Like they need to hear those stories and, and impart other people too, because it does help to hold them accountable. Um, and I think it's okay um, to call people out when they don't uh, back up their promises. Um, that's just how democracy is supposed to work. It's a two-way street. I totally agree with Kia. This is the moment when people are paying attention. So, you know, I, again, like I'm a big believer in collective action. I think all of us need to be mobilizing all the time, but like, let's be honest, we, we need to, we need to ration that. We need to like, you know, we need to be realistic. Not everybody can, you know, hold everybody accountable for everything all the time. But right now for three months, my message to you is like, give all the time you can fight for the government that you want to that you want right now because this is the three month sprint uh in which we can really make a difference martha you may be on mute yeah sorry somebody in the put a q a question in the q a whether having a national holiday on election day is important and if so how do we get one yes it's very important and i really hope that we will get one uh, I mean, we were, we're gonna, we, uh, you know, the topic of this discussion is about voter suppression. And uh, maybe this is just an opportunity to just delve into that for just a moment. I mean, Kia's entire group is about uh, fighting it now and fighting a very long legacy of disenfranchising people. In this country, um, what we know is that seemingly neutral rules you know, about how elections are run have the effect and many times were written specifically to make it harder for certain people to vote, right? Uh, racial minorities, people with disabilities, people who don't speak English, young people, poorer people. Um, and there is a very, very long history uh, going back to a, a time in this country when, of course, many of the groups I mentioned were categorically excluded from voting. And uh, now participate at much, much, much lower levels. We have our voting take place during, for most people, the work day, right? That doesn't, that's not a rational system. Uh, and if your goal is full participation, I'm proud to work for organizations, and Kia certainly does, that are dedicated to the idea that we get the best government when everybody who's part of this society gets to participate. Our goal is everybody votes, right? And, um, and those are not the rules that we have right now. We have rules uh, that say you have to have your car registered in the state where you vote, which are specifically written to make it harder for students to vote in the states where they're going to school. We have uh, laws that create ID cards that are harder for poorer people to get and for racial minorities to get. And then we say you have to bring that card with you if you wanna get let in to vote. We've closed 1600 polling locations in this country in minority neighborhoods since the gutting of the Voting Rights Act, which is one of the reasons why there's so much energy right now to pass a new Voting Rights Act named for uh, Representative John Lewis, who passed away just a couple of weeks ago after a lifetime fighting for the right to vote. So. Yeah, election day should be a holiday. So I just wanted to encourage um, Tarun, I think we have time for one more question from you, but then I, I wanted to encourage people to put their questions in the Q&A and we will begin to take your questions. Awesome. So the final question I had was looking back at your journey, both as a civically engaged citizen and as someone who has worked in the public sphere for both of you. What is the biggest lesson do you think you've learned or something you wish someone told you earlier along that journey that you think either would have influenced it or changed your perspective right now? Um, this is probably gonna be cliche, but I think 
if you're going to go into public service, like it just always has to be about the people um, at the heart of everything you do. Um, that's just who it should be about. And like I've learned from colleagues along the way, it's kind of like, what's your why? Um, what's that like one person or that one group or like that one thing that everything you do is just in tied, like tied to that. So mine is, I grew up in a single parent household. So even with voting, I'm always thinking about the single mom and how is she able to vote on election day if she can't get time off of work or if she's working constantly and can't go vote. Like that's always at top of mind for me. And same thing for housing and like any other issue. Like I'm just always thinking about my why and my passion. Um, and honestly, that will get you through the roughest days when you don't win because <laughs> you aren't always going to win. Um, and I think I'm just kind of getting at the stage where you go in all bright eyed and bushy tailed and you're like, I'm going to change the world in a year and it's going to be great. And like, everything's going to be fine. You quickly learn it's not going to happen. Um, but you constantly work at it and you start to get these small wins and you constantly remember, um, why you went into public service and it's for your neighbors and your friends, um, and everyone around you. And I think that's just so important that it's not about you. <laughs> I mean, I totally agree with that too quick. I mean, I guess to sort of directly sort of agree with everything and align myself with everything Kia said, I also just want to say the, the New York Times had an article the other day about a high school student uh, in Georgia, I think outside Atlanta, who recognized one of the problems that we're talking about, which is that there are aren't enough people to work the polls and just started an organization to recruit high school students, I think from his own high school, to, um, to sign up to help. And what I hope that story teaches us is that um, there is a role for every single person on this call to either sign up to volunteer with an organization, or if you look around and you don't see somebody doing something that's going to make a difference in your own community, just start doing it because we don't have uh, we don't have a moment to waste you know i have a i have a 15 month old daughter and the reason that i'm doing the work i'm doing is that i want her to know that i spend these 3 months in a flat out sprint to uh, win her the government that she deserves and uh, you know so whatever it is that's, you know, making you feel excited or angry every day, just use it uh, and, and put it to work. All right. Good, Martha. Can we ask the questions in the chat? There's a good one about the voter ID that Mike referred to. There are different rules in different states about what is the uh, acceptable ID. Uh, again, I guess people go to their Secretary of State to find out their rules, but is there some way to make it easier? And some states have made it easier for people to get ID. What's, what's the best policy and what should people do in the next three months? Well, I think it is, I think it is always, you know, you always have to know the rules as they exist right at the time. And uh, campaigns and uh, a tremendous number of very smart uh, nonprofit groups. I'm thinking about uh, the Lawyers Committee, Martha. I'm thinking about um, All Voting is Local. I'm thinking about just like, uh, you know, Fair Fight Action, for example, are out there send, spreading really good, truthful information so that you know exactly what you need to do. And, not a, and we're not creating a bunch of imaginary roadblocks where people think voting is scarier or harder than it is. Um, and we're and also we're there to help people sort of overcome a hurdle, right? If um, you know, if there is one in their pathway. I mean, right now, 90 days out from the election, there is no reason why anybody in this country who wants to vote in November uh, shouldn't be able to. And if you know somebody who you know is, you know, for one reason or another, hasn't voted before, has moved, right? Maybe hasn't gotten their they're hand together to do this, right? Reach out and help them or, you know, reach out to one of these organizations and say, I know someone who needs help voting because there are people right now who are very interested in helping your friend or neighbor vote. Yeah, Mike's completely right. Um, and 
for Georgia specifically, voter ID has been a huge thing because it's an overwhelming amount of paperwork um, that you need to be able to get a photo ID. Um, Cause you have to have two utility bills, like a, I'll start a passport or a social security card. Um, a lot of things that people just don't have laying around and we forget that sometimes. Um, do I think it's gonna change in the next two months? Probably not. Um, but what we can do is just making sure that we're helping people start that process now. So by the time November comes, they're ready and they have everything. That's really <laughs> the best course of strategy. All right, we have two more we have two more questions. One is from Stephanie. What role do you think institutions of high and Martha, you may want to take this one on too. What role do you think institutions of higher education have in safeguarding voting rights for this upcoming election? What role do students have? Um, I'll take it. So one, give your students election day off would be a great start to that process. Um, I remember having professors in college that were like, no, my class meets on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so you better be here. It's like, um, and especially so many students being displaced because whether schools or some schools are opening up or not is still very much up in the air in some places. Um, and where students are going to be able to register, I would love to see colleges making sure that students have that information, um, whether it be how to change your um, address where you're registered to vote or how can you vote where you live on campus and, and disseminating all that sorts of information. I would love to see colleges do heading into the November elections would be amazing. But the election day holiday would be a great start. <laughs> and let me just go one other on that, Kay. I think you'd agree with this. Um, colleges should help their students register to vote. Definitely. Yes. I mean, just let me just say it one more time. Colleges should help their students register to vote. When you show up on campus, right? Or if you don't show up on campus, right? It should be part uh, of orientation, by the way. What's that? It should be part of orientation. Exactly. So, you know, and, and, and even if it's remote, right? This is an opportunity. A lot of students get through high school without having an opportunity to register. That's its own problem we can talk about. Uh, but if the question is what can colleges do, make sure everybody's registered. They can register at home, they can register on campus, like, but they should. And also access to absentee ballot applications would also be one I would add. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And I think uh, demanding even now and certainly by September, if you're going to college, that your college do these things, integrate the voter registration and the information about absentee ballots applications into class registration. Uh, and if they're not doing, ask them why not. And it, you know, if one of the answers is, well, not everybody here is allowed to vote. Well, everybody is allowed to participate and make it possible for other people to vote. And so there are lots of roles for everybody to play. I do think it really does matter to have everybody give, getting the same message and to have leadership and faculty and staff all saying, uh, I, I'm voting, are you? Uh, and I think we shouldn't just wait till election day to wear those buttons. We should actually have a button way earlier. Say, I have a plan to voting to you. You know, I just, I just on this topic, and Kia, I'm interested both, Mike and Kia, your thoughts about this, but you know, my understanding is that the most effective people in registering students is other students, it's other young people. And that what you really want to facilitate is peer, um, peer mobilization and peer engagement and that universities should create opportunities, faculty and other folks in universities should create opportunities for students to organize each other. That makes sense to you or you? Absolutely, yeah. So last year, Fair Fight Action, we started piloting our collegiate arm, Fair Fight U. So we're at 15 college campuses all across Georgia we're, and one at Howard. We're just staying there for now, just trying to see um, what's going on. And it's been amazing. Like basically how we work is I kind of help the students gather information, but then they're the ones actually sending that information and disseminating it to their peers, holding all their own events, they all started their own Instagram pages where like they post in information all the time. And what I've loved to see with it is that we've been able to tailor 
specific voting issues to every campus. So we may have a commuter campus. Their voting issues are gonna maybe be a little different from University of Georgia, which is like this huge school, or like an Emory that has attracts students from all over the country. So we've been kind of been able to see um, how they share all this different type of information. And students now go to them. Like they know if they have an issue voting on campus, like, oh, just, direct message the Fair Fight U chapter on your campus and they'll be able to answer your question. And it's been such a huge help. Um, and they've been doing such a phenomenal job getting students on their campus fired up about voting, so. Great, thank you. Mike, did you want to speak to, to this or should we move on next question? Next question? Okay, um, from Annie, how do we help people who have just started to understand issues they care about and realize the power of voting to keep this momentum and to keep reading, going to meetings, et cetera. I think this is a question that's been coming up a lot, that we have an election of crucial importance coming up and everyone's got to get mobilized around this, but how do we maintain this momentum long after this election? Well, I mean, I think it starts from a recognition that uh, changing our government uh, and and protecting and strengthening our democracy is not gonna happen on one day, right? We, this is a long project to uh, rebuild trust and bring new uh, voices into government and empower people who've been marginalized and left out for far too long. And I think that that is just one reason why we have seen so many tens of millions of Americans in the streets over the last several months um, and uh, in response correctly to the frustration that people feel really across the political spectrum with um, what is happening in this world right now, right? I mean, and to say nothing of the fact that we're many of us stuck in our homes uh, all the time because of a pandemic while we send um, many workers out into the fray every day, um, because of economic necessity. So I, I think people need to stay aware of what is going on and continue to channel it in positive directions. I'm a believer that the um, what's happening in the what's happening when people go out and mobilize and march is is plays a critical role in enacting change, but you got to do both at the same time. So we got to vote, we got to organize, we got to get the right people into office, and then we got to keep marching. Um, yeah, I'm just going to echo what Mike said. I think we ended up in a very special moment this year, like Mike was saying, where we all got stuck at home and kind of had to face the reality of everything um, that was happening. And it really made people sit down and have to watch and care and think and read and learn and listen and all these amazing things. Um, and I think we just need to keep that up even after we're all back to work and life goes back to somewhat normal. I think we're gonna have to keep pushing each other to take that time um, to watch what else is happening in our world and to care about it and to continue to go out and protest if we need to and continue to register people to vote or whatever that may look like for you. So, yeah. Okay. Well, beautifully put and a good note to end on. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. Big, big virtual clap hand for you for you all um thank you tarun and martha for interviewing thank you for mike and kia for your words of wisdom about this um we should wrap up but i wanted to just let you know about our speaker on thursday um marshall gans is one of the leaders in the country um on community organizing um he's a faculty member in the at the kennedy school and um he will be joined by someone who does field organizing um, for this session. But uh, Mar Marshall is inspiring and I think we will all have a lot to learn from him. So again, a big warm thanks to our speakers and um, uh, we will see you on Thursday. We'll hope to see you on Thursday. Take care everybody, be well.